Hello everyone and welcome to this episode of Self Made with D Brown CEO. Our next guest grew up in Westlake Projects in Youngstown, Ohio. Westlake is the first and oldest housing project in the U.S. and is where she resided with her parents and three siblings. During an overnight stay at her grandmother's house, she and her siblings survived a house fire that claimed the life of her cousin. She was saved by an uncle who threw her from the second story safely into the arms of her family members. She was a star athlete in high school and was also active in the debate team, chess team, and student government. She then attended Howard University for her master's and doctoral studies. And she currently serves as adjunct professor in the executive MBA program in the Howard School of Business. She's a New York Times bestselling author who has worked in the political arena for the last 20 years. She has worked for two US presidents, the Department of Commerce Technology Agency, and the Office of the Vice President in the White House. She is an acclaimed TV reality star and has been featured on numerous talk shows, movies, and television shows. She's an ordained minister and was commissioned as the military chaplain in the California State Military Reserves. She currently serves as assistant pastor at Mount Calvary Church in Jacksonville, Florida. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Omarosa. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Dee. I'm so excited to be here. Oh, I'm so happy to have you here. <laughs> this, is a, this is gonna be a really good interview. Now, I wanna get started with the interview. So I, knew you, I know you grew up, grew up in the um, projects of mm -hmm. Youngstown, Ohio. Tell me a little bit about your experience as a child there. First of all, Dee, I'm so excited to be here and to be a part of your inaugural season of Self Made. Thank you. Um, and I appreciate that I get to be here in Peoria and doing that, so thank you. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> um, I did, I grew up in Youngstown, Ohio, and Youngstown reminds me a lot of Peoria. As I was uh, driving down the street here, I was thinking about what it was like growing up with those winters, with the yeah, cold, right. with the snow. But I also think very fondly of, of just spending time with my very big family. And yes, I grew up in Westlake and that's a big part of my life. Um, and I really didn't know at the time right. how bad it was because it was so much of the norm. Yeah. Um, until I was in junior high school and one of the teachers said, I want you all to raise your hand if you've ever been exposed to um, any gun violence or something. And you know, most of the class raised their hand. Right. And then they said, "Well, have you ever, you know, heard of a shooting or something or this and that?" And I'm, all of my classmates that I grew up with were all just raising our hand because it was just so common right. for us in Westlake. Um, but I truly believe it's it's not where you're from. It's where you at, and look at me, I'm up in Peoria. Right, right, <laughs> well you, you survive, you know, and that's, that's the good thing about it. Mm -hmm. um, I remember growing up, someone told me one time, they said, we stay in the ghetto. I was like, no we don't. <laughs> and, I, I, and I was serious about it, I'm like, we, we don't stay in the ghetto. Right. And you don't know what your circumstances are when you've never seen or experienced anything, right? So you feel like- This is it. This is it, this is just <laughs> right. normal. So you just, you really, you're really blind to it until you go on in life and you experience things and you realize like, whoa, I, you know, I, I, I used to live in a house that's smaller than my yacht. Yeah, one of your, um, one of your amazing uh, producers sent me pictures that they had found uh -huh. while doing research of Westlake. Yeah. And it kind of blew my mind because I hadn't seen those pictures in a very long time. Right. But when you look at them, you know, you go, wow, I, I grew up in Brick City. Right. I grew up in Westlake, so... But you know, um, a big thing going on right now uh, in the country is uh, there's a lot of focus on diversity, mm -hmm. uh, equity, and inclusion, right? <laughs> and so, of course, yeah, you recently joined uh, my firm as the chief uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion officer. But I really want you to tell my viewers your stance on that subject. Uh, you know, it's the interesting thing about the timing is, D, at the time that um, we connected through a mutual friend. I was in a program at the Howard University School of Business studying exactly that, yeah. um, equity, inclusion, and um, diversity, and getting a certification. And I was thinking, 
I don't know if I'm ever going to use this. Right. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's like the, in, the, in the middle of a pandemic and I'm trying to, you know, just grow as a person and improve right. myself. And I thought, this is a great credential, but, you know, a lot of this information because of the spaces that I work in may not, you know, may not apply. Yeah, may not be applicable. And then a month, a month later. <laughs> <laughs> we end up on the phone. <laughs> we end up on the phone. And I have an opportunity to work with your firm. Right. And might I say, um, in, in the time that I've worked at your company, learning the statistics about the lack of representation right. of African-Americans in your field, in your right. space, in construction, um, and the complete lack of, of women right. in that space right. shows that not only are you thinking about how important it is, but you're doing something about it. Right. So um, together, we want to increase those numbers and make sure that there are opportunities for minorities and women in growing out infrastructure in this country. And right. we've heard about the right. dialogue and the discussion about it in, in the trillion dollar um, infrastructure bill that was just passed. But it's also about the lives of people. Right. It's about health centers that you build, yes. student housing. It's about, in, in this case, a project you're working on a coroner's office, for instance. No right. one thinks about those buildings and the roles that they play, but right. working for P3, it, it's impacted me in a different way. Well, I'm, I'm actually glad to hear that. And I, one of the things I want to come in on, uh, based on what you just said, is that when you talk about this topic, yeah. it's, you, it, you really have to be intentional about mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know diversity, equity, and inclusion. Yes. A lot of people put programs in place to check a box, but there will never really be any substantial change in this area until individuals are intentional about uh, the topic, but not just giving someone a contract to say, right. I checked the box, I did it, but also trying to make sure that you help build capacity yeah. and, and build uh, capital and those things that are necessary for companies to grow and thrive and be a part of the um, communities that they, they yeah. And they the serve. difference is um, diversity, equity, and inclusion is in the DNA of P3. Right. 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 It's, 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 it's a part of who you are and what you do. We were doing an event in, in Atlanta, you know, and, and it was an event to celebrate. But you also stopped and said, okay, so how are we raising money for the HBCUs in this city? Right. It wasn't like, um, I'm just going to check a box, but it's a part of every single aspect of what you did. When we were in, in Miami doing the Orange Blossom um, uh, Classic, raising money, right. raising the profile, impacting students and meeting right. them at the point of their need, is in the DNA of P3. And I think that that's one of the really keys to the success of your build, your business. No, I, I built that model around doing good by doing good, meaning I do good as an enterprise mm -hmm. because I do good in the communities that yes, I serve. I agree. And so we don't enter a community and make money in that community without giving something back to that community whether it's our uh, 10 grand for the band initiative, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, whether it's our summer math and reading academy, whether it's through scholarships and endowments, uh, we're going back impacting those communities because we know that by doing that, we're gonna empower that community. We're gonna, we're gonna leave it better than we found it. Yes. And it also helped build our brand and our success story. And I think that's why people continuously call us and wanna do business with us. But also talking to the students, and I don't wanna bemoan the point, but um, talking to the students whose lives that you impacted when we were, when we were at Orange Blossom Classic, you know, you get to work with amazing people. Emmett Smith is an example. And you guys walk in the room and the kid next to me, he's like, is, is, is that Emmett Smith? You right, know, right. and you, get, you got up and gave this moving speech that touched his life and then tag team, then Emmett Smith gets up yeah. and give this moving speech. So it's not just also about donating money. Right. It's the power of the message that, that children become what they see. Exactly. So they see these two amazing, outstanding African-American men, and they see that they, too, can come from where you've come, Clarksdale, shout right. out, <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then, you know, end up in places that you just never even imagined. Well, you know, that's the beauty of this show. The mm -hmm. beauty of this show is that we're actually allowing people and communities to see positive content, positive role models, mm -hmm. uh, not perfect role models, yes. but positive, right? right? Uh, people who have pulled themselves up from nothing, uh, made a better life for themselves, and they can do it also just by having the grit and the grind, the commitment, the hard work, 
and, and ingenuity to, to make it happen. And this country actually afford them that opportunity, uh, regardless of all of the negative things you may hear or things that people may say, mm -hmm. they, they actually have that opportunity right here in America uh, and it's unprecedented opportunities. And I think you're living proof of that. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Living you. proof of that and living proof of God's grace and mercy as well. You're going to have us having church in here, D. Brown. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go, South Me. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch gears just a little bit. Okay. okay so, uh, you know, we all love uh, Mama Rosa, right? <laughs> <laughs> and we know the two of you are extremely close and y'all come and hang out on the yacht together yes, and to all do. my events. and. And so, you know, we, we love y'all, y'all are family. And, and so my question to you is that, um, how has she impacted your life and who you are as a person? Oh, man, uh, you can have me crying up here on Self Made. Uh, <laughs> first of all, I have to tell you the story of how my mother got her nickname. So my mother's real name is Teresa Manicall, and I always call her mom, Mother Teresa because she is a saint to me. <laughs> but um, I have had an opportunity to do The Tonight Show with Jay Leno. Yeah. And Jay Leno has a very unique um, thing that he does he cuts out time, he carves out time in his prep to go and not just say hello to his guests, but he comes and hangs out with them. Yeah. And so I, you know, during the course of my 10 years with NBC, I've, I've done The Tonight Show several times, and he would come, plop down on the couch, and he goes, hey, Omarosa, and then he turns to my mom and he goes, hey, Mama Rosa. <laughs> and the next time we, gave, we, we, we came back, he had had her a mug made. And, yeah. And all of that. So that's how my mom got her nickname oh, uh, wow. I in, not in Hollywood. Yeah, yeah, from Jay Leno. But um, my mother just, oh, she's just a force. And you've had a chance yeah. to, to see her. Seeing things through my mother's eyes uh, allow me to appreciate them in yeah. different ways. So I took my mother to Paris. My mother's an artist. She has a book called Art My Way. Yes, I'm plugging. And um, she she wanted to go first to, to, see, to the Louvre to yeah. see Mona Lisa, and then she wanted to go to Paris to see Eiffel Tower. Um, so my mother gets to the Eiffel Tower, and she looks up, and she goes, Oni, which is my nickname. She says, but I want to go to the top. And I was right. like, and people wonder where I get it from. <laughs> <laughs> like, I want to go to the top. She looked all the way up there, and she said, it's not enough to just get here and stand <laughs> right. in front of it and take my mama wanted to go to the top right. of the Eiffel Towers. Now, mind you, I hadn't bought any tickets. I had not made any preparation. But when Mama Rosa says she wants to go to the top. She's going to the top. She's going to the top. <laughs> and, I, and, and because of her, yeah. when I said I wanted to go to the top, she figured it out. Right. And I was able to climb and reach heights I never imagined. Now, you all co-authored a book together, Yes, right? we did. After my, like? after my my brother was killed, there's a thing called art therapy. Uh-huh. And we took an art class, we did an art therapy class, and the instructor said, you guys should think about turning your work into a book. And I, and I looked at my mom and like, what about it, mom? Do you wanna, yeah. do you wanna do a book? And she's like, oh, you know, I'm still healing. She's trying, man, she threw so much of her heart and passion into the book. It is called Art My Way, Mama Rosa's Guide to a Vibrant Life. Wow, and it's, nice. it is co-authored by us. Um, and it was a wonderful healing process to yeah. take something so tragic and pour it out on pages and to create something so beautiful. Right, so, right. yeah, um, Art My Way was my um, my second book. Mm -hmm. So, but your your last book debuted as a New York Times number one bestseller. Right? Yes. <laughs> T tell me about that book and how can I get a copy? <laughs> That's what I need to know. D. Brown, <laughs> I'll get you a copy of Unhinged. Um, and, and I have to say to you that the day that my publisher called me, Simon & Schuster published a book, um, the, the day Simon & Schuster called to tell me that I debuted at number one yeah. is a day that I'll never forget because we were rushing to some interview. I'm, I'm stuck in New York traffic. Yeah. And, um, and the phone rings and the publicist hands the phone over behind me and it's the head of Simon & Schuster. And she goes, are you ready for this? Yeah. And I said, I'm ready. She says, you made the list. And all we were hoping for was to be in one of those slots on the list. You right. know, there's, there's 15 slots. And all I said is, Lord, I just want to be, I could be number 15. Right. I just want to be it. able to say bestsellers list. Right, right. She said, are you ready for this? <laughs> You're debuting at number one. And I just, wow. I mean, could you imagine? Number one. It was just, it was remarkable. And even now to hear people um, say that your book touched my life or thank yeah. you for writing the book. 
that's why you do it. You know, that's right. why you, you right. do things even like this is so that you have an opportunity to share your story. Yeah. Right. There's a, yeah. there's a <laughs> there's an old African proverb that says, as long as the hunter is telling the story, uh -huh. the lion will always be the aggressor. Right. Right. That's right. <laughs> right? And That's so I point. always want to tell the story. I don't want anyone to describe me in a way that doesn't reflect what my experiences have been. Right. And, you know, that's important because what I've noticed since we've met each other and we've done a lot of events together, probably thousands <laughs> and thousands of people. Right. Everyone tells me, like, she's nothing like I thought. You know, like you're, they, <laughs> when they meet you, yeah. you're a totally different person than what they envision based on the misconceptions uh, that are out there. Well, now, Dee, I have to address that because, yeah. you know, some of their misconceptions come from a show that I did 20 years ago. Yeah. And I recognize the impact and the power of TV. Right. When I walked in the boardroom in my 20s, on fire. I was going to take over, you yeah. know, I was going to take over network TV. You know, I was going to, I was going to take over corporate America, take over the sweet, right. sweet, C suite. I was going to be the boss. And I can understand how that has left an impression of people that I'm still that ambitious 20 something year old right. in New York, kicking down doors, you know, taking names, yeah. not taking no for an answer. I was extremely outspoken and aggressive. And I didn't take no for an answer. And I recognize that at the time, America wasn't ready for, um, for a woman to quite show up that way on their television yeah. screens. And so I own a bit of that. I'm unapologetic about it, but I own that the Omarosa that they met 20 years ago was, was quite something. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, but the, the interesting thing about it is that everyone... Um, else say they deserve grace and mercy and forgiveness and hey. compassion and empathy, right? And so, to evolve, And they, right? they have the right to make mistakes and recover or make decisions and rebound. That's right. That's like part of what this country is all about, the but ability. But not in TV. But in, in TV, they think I'm still in the boardroom of Trump Tower <laughs> <laughs> on Fifth Avenue negotiating a deal with Sotheby's auction house, which was yeah. a task we did. I mean, it really is kind of frozen in time, that chapter of my life. And so I thank you for saying that because I have, I have quite evolved. Um, I wish I still had a lot of that fire from when, <laughs> <laughs> you know, before life starts kicking you, you know, kicking you down, you know, you start learning. Oh, okay. There, there are lessons to be learned, but Man, that fire that I had, if I could have put that in a bottle and sewed it. Right, right. Man, I'd be rich. <laughs> <laughs> well, so you're currently enrolled part-time in law school at Southern University Law Center in Baton Rouge. So tell me how did this come about? Um, what's your motivation here? Okay, so I am in law school. A big part of it um, was, I think I shared, my, my brother was killed um, about 10 years ago. And going through the trial, there are a lot of things that I understood about the process, but I was totally unequipped, you know, to help advise my family through the situation. I mean, I could give them, you know, counseling or, or minister to them, but the legal process, I was of no help to them. And so um, I thought even then, you know, maybe, maybe I'll go to law school, but I really didn't have time in my life to do it. Yeah. But boy, did that change during the pandemic. It was the first time in my life there was nothing on my calendar, right. like no events, no yeah. conferences, no trips, no right. travel. And so um, I was fortunate enough to link up with a great group of folks at the National Bar Association and yes. your, your good friend, Carlos Moore, who allowed me to actually work for, as, him, as a paralegal. Yeah. For him. Did you know this? I did not know that. <laughs> <laughs> I worked as a paralegal at the Cocker Firm under really? okay. Carlos Moore. Yes, that's a true story. And um, was studying for the ELSA. I got accepted and now I'm part-time law student. Well, you know what, though? I, I, I never thought about it until you just said it, but that was a really good use of time, right? I mean, there was nothing going <laughs> was, on, right? Might as well get some more education. There was nothing. When I say nothing, D. Brown, nothing going on. Every single conference, yeah. event, travel, trip, even Zoom started getting canceled. So right. I had to. I had to do something. So you spent the last 20 years uh, dealing with politics, working mm -hmm. in different various roles. In 2013, you ran for the school board in L.A. Yes. So what was your motivation there? 
Yeah, you did your research. <laughs> uh, the woman that held the seat was just outstanding. I mean, she loved children. And the work that she did on the board was so important. And there were only two women on the board at the time. She was the only African-American woman. And I, 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 really, I really thought that with her passing, maybe her work would, would go. Yeah. Her, her legacy would be impacted. And I wanted to continue on. And the church I was serving at, at the time, you know, was encouraging me to run. And it was a special election, thank God, because it was only three and a half, four months. And I jumped into the race. L.A. is the second largest school system in this country. And I was funding my own campaign, you know, because yeah. I got it like that. But I did not know I was going to come up against millions of dollars uh, uh, in that race. And That's the person, a serious election in, in L.A. Oh, the person who won spent about $9 million and had the backing of, of some builders. Yeah. So, yeah. Wow. I didn't win. <laughs> so, so do you see yourself trying to venture back into politics? <laughs> oh, um, politics is in my blood, right? I, I don't believe that elected leaders should lead without being checked. It's our responsibility yeah. to keep that balance of power, right? And so, yes, I will remain in politics. I will hold elected officials from the school board to the city council to the mayor accountable. And I don't rule out running in the future. Yeah. When I finish my law degree, I may follow in the steps of some of the greatest judges that I know. And who knows? I may run again in the future. I'm not discouraged. And I encourage people to think about running for public office and getting yeah. into public service. You and I have a, uh, a common passion, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, that's HBCUs. Yes. Now, I did not graduate from an HBCU, but that's one of my biggest regrets oh. is that I, I didn't take the opportunity. I started at an HBCU and then uh, Alcorn. Trent, Alcorn. <laughs> <laughs> Shout <laughs> they, out to Alcorn. <laughs> yeah, Alcorn State University. And then I transferred to, uh, at that time, Memphis State. But now where I'm at in my life, understanding the significance Mm -hmm. of HBCUs and how they have stood in the gap uh, for communities of color. Absolutely. Uh, fulfilling those educational needs uh, for us for over 100 years. Um, I recognize that providing support uh, to those uh, institutions um, is a very, very uh, important role that I can play uh, as part of my legacy. Mm -hmm. And I know that when you were in the White House, uh, that was one of your big initiatives. So I would like yeah. for you to kind of elaborate on, on that because I know you have a a very big passion for HBCUs as well. Yeah, thank you for asking about that because it does, it's, it's a significant part of the work that I do. And when you start talking about legacy, I, I want to be remembered as a public servant who never forgot about the institutions who gave opportunities to students who would otherwise not be admitted into predominantly white institutions who have right. rejected them right. for one reason or another. But what happened to me as a result of attending HBCUs has, um, it really has kind of molded me into the, the woman that I am. When I got to Central State um, in high school, elementary school, I was uh, diagnosed with a learning disability. I, you, you mentioned the librarian who helped change my life, right. helped me to properly get diagnosed. But when I got to Central State, you know, I had, I had an, enough of a grade point average to play sports, yeah. right? So I was more of the athlete part of the student athlete. But Central State isn't that kind of that place where they pass you along. Right. Like I, I went to my math teacher and was like, yeah, numbers move on the page with me. This dyslexia thing doesn't. He's like, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're not doing that. Right. I'm going to teach you my daughter's dyslexia. I'm going to teach you how to work around that or I'm going to get you a software. I'm going to find you a program. And uh, Dr. Lewis would accept nothing less. And so I was probably doing my 11th and 12th grade at Central State. Really? I felt like that because there was the actual classes yeah. and then there was Joe Lewis's classes. Right. Where he took and he worked with me and brought me up to a college level of, of academics in that particular field. So HBCUs really allowed me to find myself too. There were times when people said that I was aggressive or I was too outspoken. And then yeah. I got to a campus of HBCUs and everybody <laughs> was <laughs> ambitious and outspoken. You know, you know, like I found my tribe. Right. I found a place where I could be myself, where I can embrace my culture, where I could yeah. celebrate who I was. And, and even now today, as I attend my fourth HBCU, uh, I would not be Omarosa Oni Manigault if 
I had not attended HBCUs. Well, they, they feel and play a very uh, critical role because that experience allow a lot of our, a lot of our um, ch children to find themselves yes. to, uh, I mean, and the experience is like none other, <laughs> right? I mean, you, it's, it's, it's just a totally different uh, experience from just the whole band aspect of it, which is why we launched the 10 grand for our band uh -huh. initiative. Um, I mean, it's just, I mean, it's a, it's a very, very good experience. And so again, that's one of my, one of my biggest regrets. Yeah, you know, I, I, when I think about um, the impact that you made, even though you didn't finish at Alcorn, I think that people will remember the, your works yeah. and how many young people's lives that you've impacted with your generosity, not just of your resources, but of your time as well. Yeah. And D2 and Vinay both graduated from uh, HBCU. Oh, which so. schools? I didn't know which so, ones. Uh, Cahoma Community, Co Community College and uh, Tennessee State University. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. So. Big shout out to HBCUs. And shout out to Big V. <laughs> <laughs> Omarosa, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much, Dee, for having me. Thank you all for watching Self Made with Dee Brown, CEO. Without you, there's no me. <laughs>